All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Sharon Van Eersdale. Um, thank you for joining us for our webinar today on telehealth innovations with COVID-19. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We do have you in mute only, but if you have questions that you would like to submit for our panelists, please submit it using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I uh, would like to kind of preserve the chat more for if you're having issues, um, but please let us know if you have questions, type in those questions and we will um, prioritize those to get those answered. My name is Sharon Van Eersdale. I am the program director for Emory Serious Communicable Diseases. I'm also the director of education for the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, formerly known as the National Ebola Training and Education Center. So we'll, we'll call it NETEC from here on out. Um, but we appreciate you all joining us today. I know everybody's very, very busy. Know that you all have a lot going on, but hopefully you'll take away some really great things that are happening in telemedicine. So we're gonna start just with a quick overview of what NETEC is, and then I'm gonna pass it on to one of my very esteemed, my great colleagues, Greg Esper, on telehealth innovations with COVID-19. Then we'll finish up with a little bit of resources that NETEC has to offer, and then finally with your questions and answers. So first, what is, who are we? The National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. So we were created shortly after the Ebola um, experience in 2015, through HHS. Um, this is a collaboration between Emory, Nebraska, and New York Health and Hospitals with the mission to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively man manage individuals with suspected and confirmed special pathogens. So NETEC really has four arms, um, you know, four different offerings that we provide. One is through assessments and consultations. So prior to COVID, uh, we would work with hospitals when we were allowed to travel, uh, we would work with hospitals and do uh, consultation on site with those facilities. We also offer a, a lot of education. So we do in-person education, again, prior to COVID and after COVID, we'll be back with our in-person education. And we do a lot of online education and we've shifted a lot to this webinar base, this, this uh, interface here uh, to, to try to respond to your needs. We also offer technical assistance. So if at any point you have questions, you can certainly email us at info at We also have an online repository with a lot of tools and resources for you that we'll, we'll highlight that as well. And then one of our newer arms is through our research network. And it's really all 10 of the regional Ebola and special pathogen treatment centers have come together to, to develop a research infrastructure so that when things like COVID-19 happen, we have the research infrastructure to be able to deploy these these therapeutic um, um, medications to, to individuals. So with that, I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Greg Esper, um, who's gonna to talk to us today about telehealth innovations with COVID-19. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with you uh, at Emory, and it's a pleasure to be working with our NETEC uh, team who uh, helped me to get this presentation ready for everyone. Uh, as Sharon uh, mentioned, I'm the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Emory Healthcare, and under that role, uh, I am the Medical Director for Telemedicine at Emory Healthcare. Uh, I'm a neurologist, and I've been uh, practicing at Emory for 15 years now. Uh, and additional to that, I have another role as the Vice President of Lean Promotion. You'll see some references to the lean operating system and lean methodologies in my presentation. And we felt, uh, I felt that it's important to articulate some of those as we go through this presentation. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about uh, Emory before COVID-19 to give you a sense of what actually was happening in telemedicine here at, uh, at Emory before uh, we uh, encountered this public health pandemic. Um, this, is a, this is a slide that basically shares what Emory Healthcare is by the numbers. We serve greater than 800,000 patients annually. We do about 100, greater than 110,000 admissions, uh, millions of outpatient visits. Uh, and you can see 11 hospitals, 250 clinics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, really the focus here for the telemedicine piece is what are we doing for our outpatient visits, what are we doing with emergency room visits, and what are we doing with inpatient admissions? 
uh, you know, during, uh, you know, during the uh, COVID crisis, uh, and we will get there shortly. But first, I do want to share that Emory has been doing telemedicine really since 2014. Dr. Tim Buckman and Cheryl Hiddleston uh, really started the Emory EICU, uh, and they started it as a way to support our ICU clinicians. Many people are probably very familiar with EICU. This is really to help our people help our patients. And our people supplant, uh, they do not, they support, they do not supplant people in the ICUs. They alert, advise, mentor, and consult uh, with people in ICUs, and they continue to do it during COVID-19. And for our patients, you know, they facilitate the identification of problems, testing, treatment, interpretation, and counseling for people on the front line in the ICU, especially if they're having difficulty managing a patient. The Emory East EICU actually uh, had partnered not only uh, inside of Emory Healthcare, but external to Emory Healthcare. It was one of the original CMMI awards, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Uh, and to that end, we needed to partner with an external group. Uh, and in this case, it was East Georgia Regional Medical Center. Um, where we actually showed that EICU could accomplish the triple aim. And this is some data that basically shares uh, how ICU mortality dropped, how transfers from the ICU to outside hospitals dropped from 8.7 to 6.6%, how the critical care average daily census at East Georgia Regional Medical Center increased 41% during the time of the intervention, and how the Medicare case mix index increased, the length of stay dropped, and the number of ICU patient days per month actually increased. And basically what this shows is that Emory, the Emory EICU program helped patients remain locally at East Georgia Regional Medical Center. The EICU helped, in, helped take care of an increased acuity of patients and also they uh, improved the quality of care by actually dropping the mortality since after EICU was implemented. Not only were we doing EICU, uh, but we were also began telenephrology uh, since September 2017. And Emory Telenephrology basically serves two rural hospitals currently uh, in the middle part of the state of Georgia providing both medical services for end-stage renal disease, acute kidney injury, and a number of other conditions. And it tries to, again, keep patients local, reducing out-migration from rural hospitals to, for instance, Atlanta, by providing a telenephrology consult, which is done via an iPad and an electronic stethoscope, and then supporting the team to uh, be able to provide inpatient dialysis with a patented e-dialysis system from one of our partners. And there is renal nursing support in that regard. This basically lowers costs and improves efficiency by keeping the patient where they need to be in, in an environment which is in their community and your family. Uh, it allows appropriate renal workflows to be in place and it allows uh, patients to not have to wait for a nephrologist to consult in a setting when there aren't any nephrologists in that part of the state. There were other small pilots that Emory was doing. I'm a neurologist, we were doing teleneurology, we are doing teleneurology at one of our hospitals internally. We have telepsychiatry up at one of our hospitals as well, doing mainly inpatient consultations. We have a mobile assessment team of social workers that uh, can be deployed to emergency rooms to assess patients in a mobile fashion as opposed to an in-person fashion. And that's again live at one of our hospitals. And we had a few outpatient pilots in various different specialties. But there were a number of factors that really contributed to not really blowing this open. Uh, and a lot of those factors were actually taken care of when our uh, federal colleagues basically lift a lot of the restrictions. And so one of the things that we actually needed to have in place 
was a telehealth team to figure out what it was we were going to do to actually take potential advantage of an emerging technology and an emerging care model to be able to see patients. The Emory Healthcare telehealth team you see before you, Sarah Keir is our vice president of access, Rob Sweeney, our telehealth administrator, and Emma Winchell, our project manager, uh, our core people that basically help set forward our goals and accomplish our mission. Mike Dufel is our IT lead uh, who helps us set up um, uh, the technology to accomplish our various care models. Elizabeth Kropinski is our vice chair of radiology and an expert in telemedicine, former president of the American Telemedicine Association, who advises us on a lot of uh, our use cases and a lot of our rollout. The telehealth team was established not only to prepare for the future, but to, but to go through RFPs to find out who would be our vendor. And we chose American Well as our vendor for telemedicine. Uh, and in fact, we actually just got finished signing a contract, but that actually, and we had planned a phased rollout, but COVID happened right as we were doing all of that work. So while American Well will be our platform moving forward, we had to figure out rapidly how to spin up a platform to solve the problems of COVID-19 before our American Well uh, contract actually has taken effect. And so what does Emory now look like during COVID-19 or DC? Basically, there were a lot of imperatives that actually happened during COVID, but none more important than these two, which were social distancing and the need to preserve PPE. Social distancing was important for our patients to not be able to have to sit in a waiting room um, and be and be uh, uh, and be basically submitted to the possible for community spread for COVID. And additionally, uh, we had uh, people you know don't normally social distance. It, it's not a typical um, strategy for human beings to be able to do that. And not only that, um, as the COVID pathogen has emerged and the understanding of it has emerged and the understanding of the needs to mask and do all of those types of things, social distancing became a way uh, for us to control the spread, to uh, take the curve and flatten the curve and to, uh, and to do so so our hospitals would not be overwhelmed. Additionally, PPE uh, had, been in, uh, had been in supply beforehand, but rapidly we understood that it would become, that it would become short supply especially with the burn rate that was happening as we moved forward in caring for the COVID patients in not only the inpatient settings, but also understanding what was necessary to do so from an outpatient setting. And these were really the two major reasons for us to consider the use cases for telemedicine. Before we go on for telemedicine, it's important to understand some definitions. Telehealth is providing care at a distance, utilizing medical and related transfer data via audio, video, and other types of telecommunication technologies. This can be used not only to provide healthcare, but also to educate and administrate and improve the public health. Models like Project ECHO have, imp have impacted significantly distance learning and program planning and other supportive mechanisms that actually can improve the health generally of populations. Telemedicine refers specifically to bi-directional remote clinical services. And specifically, this looks at live audio video conferencing, uh, asynchronous store and forward methodologies that are in place for things like teleradiology, teledermatology, and telepathology, even teleophthalmology with the reading of uh, with the reading of fund uh, fundoscopy uh, for teleretina. Additionally, uh, things like remote patient monitoring uh, for chronically ill patients uh, are part of telemedicine, as well as some aspects of mobile health. Uh, and so these are critical to understand what telemedicine is as opposed to telehealth. More definitions. What is the originating site? And what is the distance site? 
The originating site is where the patient is. The distant site is where the provider is. So it's very possible for a provider in a hospital be, to be looking at a robot of the patient on the left, for instance. And it's very possible for the patient on the right to be at home and to be asking for some help from a healthcare professional and a healthcare professional can be using audio video technology to be able to deliver that care. So again, the originating site is where the patient is and the distant site is where the provider is. The legislative changes that spurred the adoption of telemedicine basically had a major effect on the originating site. CMS lifted the rural site restriction, allowing uh, home as the originating site. Before that period of time, the, uh, the, the originating site needed to be a rural clinic. So one of my neurology patients, if they wanted me to see them via telemedicine, could not just start seeing me or ask for a consultation while they were in their home. They actually needed to go to a rural clinic and they needed to be in a rural clinic. And you can imagine if there are a bunch of rural clinics uh, and you have a schedule of a half day or a schedule of a full day and you're trying to coordinate across five, six, seven, eight rural clinics, it can be very operationally challenging. So when CMS allowed home as the originating site, that was a major lifting of a restriction that really spurred telemedicine. And specifically, we were able now to bill for that visit at home. Additionally, the DEA allowed prescription of narcotics by telemedicine visits. Now, importantly, this was a federal guideline and the state of Georgia and other states in the union had also to adopt this, that in fact, providers could use telemedicine to prescribe schedule two through five medications. People think about narcotics, but really this is schedule two through five. For instance, um, in patients that were managing with, with pregabalin for uh, pain management, pregabalin is actually a, a scheduled medication that would not be allowed to be prescribed by telemedicine. If we were managing seizure disorders by drugs like lacosamide, that would not be able to be prescribed because it is a scheduled medication. Ativan for patients that, uh, that have anxiety disorders and are being cared for by telepsychiatry. This, uh, the lifting of this restriction enabled the practice of medicine also to be enhanced by telemedicine. In addition to the auto video capability, for those patients that don't have access to video, CMS allowed reimbursement for telephone calls. And they even have, uh, prior to COVID, had allowed reimbursement uh, for portal visits or for e direct digital consults. Uh, but the lifting, the, the lifting of a restriction and the reimbursement for telephone calls was new after COVID because they wanted people, again, to remain safe in their homes, to be able to socially distance while still having access to medical care. Practice across state lines, though, has been limited. For instance, in Georgia, we are contiguous with five states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Alabama, and Tennessee. While Florida and North Carolina have lifted restrictions and have allowed practice to actually occur across state lines in limited instances, uh, South Carolina requires uh, an expedited license to be done, and it, and it lasts for 90 days. And so you really have to know and understand the rules for delivering care by telemedicine across state lines. So it's not a panacea. There are still legislative and regulatory burdens that we have to be thinking about. So when Emory actually understood that we had an opportunity to, uh, to maintain access for patients using telemedicine, but a lot and, and, and facilitate social distancing uh, and also to preserve the burn rate on PPE, we had to do something rapidly. And so what we did was we developed a policy on telehealth that was approved by our chief medical officers and, uh, and will be subsequently approved by our MECs when, they actually be able, when they're actually able to get together again. Under that policy on telehealth, 
we said we are going to certify providers under their current privileges and credentials as opposed to asking them to re-privilege and re-credential every two years. And our legal team felt that this was the best way to do things as did our medical staff office. And so we had to come up with a certification platform. How are we gonna actually certify these folks? So we developed a health stream learning center module, which was three modules. That was followed, and those three modules were, what is telehealth? What is telemedicine? What are the positives? What are the, what are the limitations? When do we use it? When do we not use it? It had a lot of billing, coding, regulatory, legislative information uh, that was important. And this was pre code and this was a lot of, a lot of this actually um, was before CMS lifted the restrictions. And that's how we had to actually certify our folks with the work on, with um, the actual policy before the restrictions were lifted. And then finally, how do you do a telehealth visit? What's the lighting supposed to be like? How are you supposed to interact with the patient? Should you eat during a visit? What do you wear during a visit? Do you have you know, a, a big window in the background during a visit and so forth? And so really, um, that was kind of the third module on telemedicine. We followed those learning modules by a provider assessment of 10 questions that the providers had to pass at greater than 80% uh, uh, getting 80% uh, correct. And that was followed by an attestation that they knew that they needed to be trained to use uh, telehealth, uh, to, to, to actually be able to use telemedicine in the, in the formats that we, were, uh, that we were asking them to do that. So then we had, once we knew that we had a certification program in place under our privileges and credentials and under the policy, we needed to understand what platforms were available. And we had already, in, we already have an, uh, an Emory Healthcare and an Emory University instance of Zoom that was HIPAA compliant, but FaceTime and Google Duo were actually created also uh, as uh, potentially non-HIPAA compliant uh, resources for us to be able to use as well. So this restriction that was lifted, again, allowed us to use non-HIPAA compliant audio video, which made it much easier for us to access our patients and for our patients to access us. And so we had to create operations that actually allowed us to implement these things. And this slide is basically to show you all of the work that our team did to actually create operational steps for our sections and our doctors and our advanced practice providers to be able to use these various options. And what you'll see here is a bunch of um, stuff for Zoom. What is our mobile startup guide? Um, what is the Zoom web startup guide? What does Zoom scheduling look like? What does, the, uh, uh, what does the Zoom web startup look like for providers versus patients? Uh, you know, what, is, um, what are some of the protocols for scheduling? Uh, how, what the various webcams that we recommend for computers that were in the clinic if people were going to use their mobile device, their, their tablet, or their computer that had a camera itself. Uh, and you'll see over here on the right, uh, the uh, Emory, uh, Emory School of Medicine uh, policy uh, for uh, conducting telehealth with residents and fellows. So we actually uh, talked with our associate, uh, with our dean for graduate medical education, as we knew the residents and fellows probably wanted to deliver care via this mechanism, and we knew we they needed to do that based on some of the operational models that our that our clinicians have, and so we developed a policy that basically put um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, burden of training and certifying those residents and fellows on us as the Emory Telehealth Group. But, um, but the operating model we gave to the program directors themselves. Now, how do you take an organization that has um, you know, over 41 uh, different clinic specialties, uh, 250 clinical sites, and uh, massive numbers of clinicians that want to do telemedicine? We, we had to develop a hub and spoke model, which is what you see here. So the Emory Healthcare telehealth team basically knew that we had to communicate with all of these different groups, transplant, musculoskeletal, brain health. Brain health itself has five different sections in it, neurology, neurosurgery, sleep, 
rehab and psychiatry, heart and vascular with vascular surgery, CT surgery, and cardiology. And you can go around the circle and understand IM specialties, how many different inter internal medicine specialties are there that we needed to coordinate with. So what we asked is we actually began to develop this hub and spoke model. And one of the things I want to call to your, your attention to on this slide is the dyad model. We believe in the dyad model that you need both an administrator and a, and a clinician, either an APP or a physician to be the ones that are going to say not only what the care model is going to be for that group or that section or that center, but also administratively to be able to make it happen with the operations of scheduling, uh, the cancellations, the booking of new types of visits, and not only that, but also uh, following the data on the back end and making sure that we can accomplish the goals that are set forward by the teams that are developing the care models. This was the model that allow us to do train the trainer. So a lot of the uh, clinicians in these, in these groups were trained by us and then they would go and train their own individuals uh, in their sections and in their centers. Uh, they would do that via Zoom training sessions as we would do that. And we actually had a nightly call for the first two weeks of go live since the middle of March to make sure that we as the Emory, tele, Emory Healthcare telehealth team were supporting all of these individuals as we were moving forward. We basically would share best practices on these phone calls. We, would, we actually implemented one of the lean methodologies, which is readiness huddle and situation awareness uh, for escalation purposes. And for instance, we would look at safety issues that occurred, methodological problems that folks were having, equipment problems that uh, we needed to resolve for them, uh, and whether or not staffing and supplies were optimal for them to deliver the care model via telemedicine. Uh, and that proved to be extremely effective and actually riffed off of the development of our, of our huddle, of the, of the huddle uh, uh, organizational structure that we have at Emory, which is one of the first steps to building daily management system um, in a lean operating model. We made sure that all of our folks, anyone at Emory that wants access to it can have access to the SharePoint site. And the SharePoint site contains many different types of documents. For instance, people would ask us all the time, am I allowed to practice telemedicine in this state? Well, we actually developed a website that actually has the defined legal regulations on whether or not you could practice in that state. Um, operate, we, we had a choice, basically, of some of the best practices from brain health and musculoskeletal and other groups that actually developed different ways to schedule patients that, that had slight differences based on the types of patients that were, people were seeing. All of that work is available on SharePoint. All of the billing and coding resources are available on SharePoint. All of the payer contracts and how the payers in Georgia were going to respond to telehealth are on our SharePoint site. So we were the collector of information and the convener of groups to actually look at that information. And so now we basically reference people directly to the SharePoint site so they can read and see for themselves what the actual rules are. I cannot stress enough the need to have legal and compliance uh, on, on your teams because we really rely on legal and we really rely on compliance to make sure that we're making the right decisions for our organization and that we will be safe from a, uh, from a legislative and a regulatory component so our, so our teams can provide the care the way that they want and need to do. This I took from zoom.com uh, and so, uh, and this is basically what our nightly meetings look like. They're actually now not nightly meetings anymore. It was getting a little bit much and people you know, from six to seven actually wanted to eat dinner. And so, but this is what, you know, our group has about 75 people that join. We now do them about twice per week and uh, everyone is able to see one another and we're, we're all able to talk with one another. And it's actually a great way to convene everyone to learn from everyone about how they're implementing telemedicine in their own environment. And these are some of the results that we have seen. So. What you can see is that we basically started with telemedicine in March 16th, and we've continued it, and this data is through last Friday. You know, there is, you know, how many visits were we seeing before COVID? How many telemedicine visits 
uh, are we seeing during COVID in addition to in-person arrivals? And you can see telemedicine visits in orange, and you can see a steady increase day by day uh, in the number of telemedicine visits that we were able to see as we got people trained, uh, certified, trained, uh, and implementing the best practices. We've completed over 9,000 telemedicine visits basically since March 16th in our organization. Uh, and uh, 71 providers have actually, 71% of our providers, which is numbers up, uh, uh, up uh, in the 2000s, um, have actually completed a telemedicine visit, which is really neat to be able to see. So at this point, what I'd actually like to do is um, share with you a way that we have marketed this to our patients. Because as you can imagine, patients, especially some of our elderly patients, uh, you know, might say, geez, you know, I, I really don't want to do telemedicine. I'm worried about my own personal health information. I'm worried about, you know, how can I get on to the applications that I'm going to be doing telemedicine, et cetera. And so we've actually created uh, some marketing videos that we're, that we're leveraging to help our patients understand what telemedicine can be. And you will see what that, and you'll see one of those right now. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Watson with Emory Brain Health. Thank you for your interest in the Emory Brain Health Center. Many of our clinics are currently closed due to CDC guidelines requiring social distancing. However, we can still provide you with timely and high quality care. And to do this, we've basically converted your in-person visit to a video visit, also called a telemedicine appointment. We know that you probably have some questions about this, so we're here to walk you through it today, beginning with how you'll go to your appointment. A member of our team at Emory Brain Health will email you a link with detailed instructions on how to do that. You'll also hear from a member of our care team just a few minutes before your appointment to ensure that you have everything you need and that you're good to go. You'll click on the link, and then you'll wait for your care provider to show up. Hi, Dr. Levy. Hi, Jay. Hey, everyone. This is Dr. Alan Levy. He is the head of neurology at Emory Brain Health, and he's going to walk us through how a telemedicine visit will go with any of our providers at Brain Health. Dr. Levy, why is this a good thing for me to do right now? I mean, why shouldn't I just wait till I can see you in person? Well, Jay, even with the precautions being taken due to COVID-19, we can continue to provide you with a high level of care that will empower you and your family. In fact, I would say outstanding care. Continuity of care is critically important, and even during this pandemic, we're going to be able to provide outstanding neurologic, psychiatric, rehab, sleep, and neurosurgical telemedicine visits to you really at the highest level. How will my visit go with you? Well, Jay, during your telemedicine appointment, your providers will talk with you about your symptoms, and we'll conduct an exam really in the same manner we would during an in-person visit. We will then identify a diagnosis or treatment or plan of care. So if I have an issue that needs to be addressed or if I need a prescription or something, you can handle that? Absolutely. Our telemedicine appointment will provide the same level of care, same recommendations, prescriptions, and further treatment plans that, that an in-person appointment would have. Dr. Levy, how long will I have to see my provider like this? Jay, we don't know when we're going to return to business as usual. We all want things back to normal, of course, but it could be months before this is possible. I'm worried about how to do my telemedicine appointment. No need to worry at all. Our team has worked really hard to ensure telemedicine appointments are easy to navigate for you. We're going to have personalized assistance to make sure you are prepared for your telemedicine appointment. So what about confidentiality? How can I be sure that my appointment with you will be kept private? Great question. We take patient information and confidentiality very seriously. Zoom is our HIPAA compliant program that is being used across Emory Healthcare to help us interact and continue offering care to patients in a secure manner. Your telemedicine appointment would not be recorded and it would not be shared with anyone outside of your care team. Thank you, Dr. Levy. Thanks, Jay. We hope that during these uncertain times, we can provide some certainty and some next steps to you and your family regarding your neurological care. If you're interested in scheduling a telemedicine appointment, please contact our office.
We look forward to seeing you soon um, by computer, laptop, or smartphone. So hopefully you guys uh, were able to see that. That was my chairman, Dr. Alan Levy, one of uh, the best, uh, not only neurologists, but also great chairman uh, and greatly enjoy working for him. Uh, and you can see uh, that was um, something that we wanted to do for our, our patients at the Brain Health Center. And uh, we were actually developing videos for all of Emory Healthcare, uh, as well as uh, some other specialties right now. I want to flip quickly to inpatient telemedicine. Um, what you actually are seeing on this screen is something called an A3, which is another lean operating system tool. We actually use A3s when we're trying to figure out what to do in a really in a complicated scenario, especially if we're trying to implement a project or in, implement something that we haven't done yet. And basically, the A3 takes us from the reason for action. Uh, it helps us define current and future state. Uh, it you know, allows us to think about the gaps, um, man, method, materials, machine, and milieu. Um, it, we identify a solution approach um, from which we can pick various rapid experiments. And then we actually go into actually completing those rapid experiments, documenting whether or not our current state is moving to the future state or the target state. And then what insights are we actually learning from this? And as you can see, our A3 on inpatient telemedicine consultations is not yet finished, but it's pretty robust. What we've done is we've actually selected a couple of specialties to pilot with, including urology as a surgical specialty, rheumatology as an internal medicine specialty, as well as um, nephrology and hospital medicine. Again, hospital medicine, we were planning just in case we had workforce uh, reduction uh, due, to, due to our hospitalists getting sick with COVID, we actually wanted to make sure that we had a mechanism to see patients with hospital medicine via telemedicine if that became necessary. And similarly, we've developed uh, models where our, uh, where our nephrologist is rounding on the dialysis unit with the hospital medicine folks. Uh, and then we actually have our urologists and rheumatologists working through workflows that are as variable as um, contacting the patient for an audio, visit, audio video visit on the patient's own device, um, having a nurse presenter go in with a device themselves, or actually just doing chart review uh, and, a, and a discussion uh, and a note with the referring pro uh, provider, which is a provider-to-provider -provider consultation, again, which is actually allowed to be billed by Medicare. And so in instances in which, um, for instance, an endocrinologist can make a recommendation on insulin without actually seeing the patient, they can actually see the patient and actually drop a bill that allows them to have just done chart review and to speak directly or to write a note in the patient's chart. So we are working through a number of these inpatient telemedicine consultation workflows. But the one that really warms my heart, the one that I think was so awesome, was uh, the implementation of inpatient telemedicine uh, visits for end of life by our palliative care team. So our palliative care team has done uh, probably around 30 visits by now uh, with patients that are near end of life they basically have brought the family into the room with the patient to have end of life discussions, uh, to have DNR discussions, and even to facilitate uh, the patients being able to see their families uh, uh, you know, if they are not doing well and if they are going to um, you know, have to make very difficult decisions. And I will tell you that, um, that the social isolation that can occur with patients, especially you know, because people aren't going in their room as much or their families aren't allowed to see them because we've removed, you know, we, we have taken a visitor, visitor uh, reduction uh, extremely seriously. Um, it has been, uh, this has been one of the care models that has, uh, that has just really uh, showed the humanity of doing telemedicine, which I think is critical. We've also developed a low acuity respiratory pathway ED workflow where basically a patient will arrive and they will be screened by telemedicine. And they will actually go into, uh, into a triage nurse and they will actually go to be presented by a triage nurse uh, to a provider that is on the other, that is in a control room uh, for, uh, and uh, 
able to see that patient and actually offer audio video advice and a real time synchronous evaluation for that, for that patient. Uh, we have developed a methodology that allows the patients to be uh, taken care of roughly every 15 minutes, depending on surge, uh, depending on, uh, on how much we are expecting on surge. Uh, so this model is still in development. We're actually trying to figure out how we're going to use our uh, telemedicine models in the tents that we are standing up as well. I want to talk a little bit about what's going to happen after COVID. Uh, after COVID, uh, or AC, uh, is, you know, will telemedicine be restricted again? What are health and human services and CMS going to do? What are providers who like it going to do if it gets restricted? And if patients really like it, what are they going to do? And, and will the health system still support the evolution of telemedicine, uh, which has really just broken open and so many people are seeing the value of this? Well, if restrictions occur, I can tell you um, that we absolutely need, can, can leverage this use case for things like post-operative visits because of the 90-day global fee. Um, we can use it in normal pregnancy to make sure that pregnant women are proceeding um, you know, uh, proceeding appropriately through their pregnancy. We are going to establish teleneurology throughout all our hospitals and telepsychiatry throughout all of our EDs and hospitals. Um, our oromaxillofacial surgeons and our hand call group uh, with orthopedics and plastics will likely establish it in their emergency departments. Musculoskeletal wants to do screening visits to see how to route various patients. Do we route them to uh, non-operative orthopedics or operative orthopedics. Uh, and I think it's a, an incredible tool to use in our population management uh, infrastructure. We actually take care of over 200,000 patients um, through our Medicare Shared Savings uh, uh, Program, our Medicare Advantage Platform, and our commercial shared savings programs as well. And to combine audio, video, telemedicine with support services that are necessary uh, as well as uh, remote patient monitoring and remote physiologic monitoring are, I think, are critically, um, you know, are going to be critically successful in our ability to perform the best for the patient and also to perform the best for uh, these, these shared savings programs. I also think that it's time to lobby. So for those of you that are lobbyists, you know, do you know a senator? Do you know a representative? Anybody want to send a letter to Secretary Azar or Administrator Verma and talk to them about um, how important that this is? I believe actually that Medicare is studying this and trying to understand and learn how many of their patients are actually, how many of our seniors and, and others that receive Medicare benefits are benefiting from this. And I do believe that the benefits are going to be um, good enough for them to seriously consider uh, continuing this after COVID. That to say that we don't exactly know how long the restrictions for COVID are going to last, and we'll probably have to go through another season of COVID, um, understanding that we don't have a vaccine yet that has been uh, proven to be effective. And then uh, there's always the chance for prayer, you know, do we need to actually, you know, pray for enlightenment of our, of our legislators and our regulators and to make sure that they um, actually can uh, help us uh, be able to provide this type of care to our patients. And with that, that ends my presentation. I want to kick it back over to Sharon, uh, and Sharon will take you through some of the next items, and then we'll probably do question and answer. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Greg. Um, I know I'm a little biased because I'm from Emory, but just could not be more impressed with the um, telehealth and telemedicine that, that has been set up here for our patients. So fantastic. And, and for me personally, I had to, I uh, got the opportunity to experience it on, on Friday with you. So thank you so much. Um, so a little bit on NETEC resources. First and foremost, I just want to let everybody know that this is recorded. This webinar has been recorded. Um, we will also have the PDF um, PowerPoints um, for you to download along with all of these uh, links that we have here. Um, and these resources will also be available. So on, online, if you go to NETEC.org, uh, you'll be able to go to our training uh, page with the webinars listed there from the previous webinars. Um, there'll be the links there as well as upcoming webinars that we will have to include one that we have on labor and delivery uh, that is scheduled for Thursday. Um, again, NETEC is here to help. So please send your questions to info at NETEC.org. Um, and again, if you have a question today, please submit it through our Q&A. 
Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and open up our Q&A right now. Um, starting with the first one, do you have suggestions for smaller, more resource limited healthcare systems as they look to implement telehealth programs at their facilities or practices? So the great thing is, is that a lot of the things that I have um, shared with you, for instance, the standard work on, on, uh, what, on uh, what to do with what platform, uh, I, I believe that the instructions on Zoom on Zoom are um, very straightforward. I think that for Apple-minded folks, you know, FaceTime is very straightforward, and it's just really about the practice understanding uh, how to uh, take those workflows and make them doable for them. And we actually, um, after a CMS call, we actually set out resources to a number of different. Uh, a number of different organizations, and you know, I believe that we are going to make available to NETEC uh, uh, the resources that we that Emory has developed, so that um, everyone can benefit from those. So I actually think that small uh, resource limited practices, actually, because of their nimbleness, can actually do a lot of rapid tests of change that will help them. I mean, you don't need a bunch of uh, you know, management engineers to help you to go through this process. A lot of the ingenuity can come directly from the folks in the practice. Thanks, Greg. And absolutely, NITEC would be more than happy to host some of these. I, I, I've talked offline with you about that as well, so this will be fantastic. So the next question is, as we've all heard about these Zoom bombers, um, how is Emory dealing with the poss possibility of having somebody kind of hack into the, um, into the appointment? So this is actually something where uh, Emory Healthcare, because of its enterprise license, and Emory University, because of its enterprise license, um, what had been uh, somewhat protected beforehand. But Zoom has made a lot of fixes and patches in their device to prevent that, in their uh, platform to prevent this. But additionally, there are there are important settings that need to be clicked for the pay, for the provider to make sure they know exactly who is coming into their waiting room, for instance. So one of those things is that you actually have to enable waiting room on your Zoom, uh, on your Zoom platform. You actually have to disable chat because you don't want people chatting in and actually sending in PDFs and so forth that could be considered Zoom hacking. And there are a number of other uh, considerations about Zoom hacking that we can again make available through the new tech, uh, through the new tech uh, uh, resource to be able to do that. But you can find there are ways uh, to actually uh, kind of uh, make as hack proof as possible uh, the um, uh, Zoom in particular. I will say this, that the, the security is only as good as the security of, this, of the Wi-Fi that you're logging in from. So for instance, if you're logging in from a public Wi-Fi, people who are also on that public Wi-Fi irrespective of what Emory has done, will potentially be able to hack that session. So you really kind of need to advise um, your, the patients about that. Thanks, Greg, appreciate that. Uh, so the next question, uh, do residents and fellows join the calls with their attendings during virtual visits? So that's actually an interesting question and we, and we continue to iterate over some of these models. So um, there are some, so we expect as the Emory Telehealth team that at some point during that video visit that the attending will be on with the patient to make sure that they can evaluate the patient and give the appropriate advice to the resident or the fellow or the trainee. And now whether it's right at the end during the assessment and plan phase or whether it's during just a history and physical um, in which uh, afterwards the resident will then communicate the advice uh, directly to the team that's taking care of that patient um, differs somewhat. But yes, we expect that if an attending is going to bill for that visit, that the attending is present during the video visit. Great, thank you. So the next question I think is related to scheduling. So how does the routing system work to connect a patient with a provider? Is there a central queue system that providers have access to or are the patients auto routed to providers? So this is the interesting piece about um, you know, what happens with small practices versus large practices versus practices that already have an established system uh, like American Well or Teladoc or something like that. In our system, 
we actually are scheduling them as we would schedule a normal, a normal visit. But what we've done is we've actually created separate visit types. We have created a new video visit, an established video visit, and an established telephonic visit. And our call center and our scheduling teams are actually communicating with those patients and actually scheduling those visits directly with them. There are platforms that allow, <clears throat> that allow schedules that are already populated to request uh, a certain type of uh, visit. Um, we don't have that up and running yet. So we're actually, even though we're such a large system, we would actually be doing it very similarly to what a small system does right now. Great. Thank you. Um, so the next question, you talked a little bit about the uh, competency. So did, did you implement a competency for staff performing telehealth visits? Um, and if so, is that a resource that we would be willing to share? So we don't we don't actually have a we don't actually have a competency for the clinicians that are doing the telehealth visit. We believe that telemedicine is a tool in which the provider is the best judge uh, of of how they are going to deploy that uh, that tool. So I can tell you that from I'd be very happy to judge the competency of a neurology visit uh, because I'm a neurologist and I know how to do the neurological exam. Uh, but I would not be able to tell you, um, you know, how an orthopedic person should do it or how a transplant physician should do it uh, or how uh, um, other, other clinicians should do it. So we are, we are making, we are engaging the leaders in those sections to basically say, we think this is the best way to do an examination. One of the documents that I showed you in that earlier slide on operations is that we have created um, what we believe is the appropriate telemedicine examination for sections. So dermatology did the skin exam. Musculoskeletal, our orthopedic colleagues did the musculoskeletal examination. I set up the neurology examination. And so that telemedicine document, which shows how to examine a patient on telemedicine, um, is what we consider to be the standard. Great, thank you. Uh, so what has been the hardest thing to implement operationally to enable the inpatient telemedicine system? The number of devices. And Sharon knows this, uh, uh, you know, e extremely well because on the care model task force, we basically talk about um, how are we implementing telemedicine and the, and the constraint is the number of devices, how many devices are on a floor and the workflow for getting that device in the room. Uh, and and we, we are solving that problem as we get devices and as we do tests of change. Yeah, so, so great. There's one that came in through the chat box that I think is kind of similar. It says with, with nursing home services, um, uh, services of the nurses provide services for elderly patients at home. Most of these patients don't have smartphones, let alone internet. Uh, would smartphones be provided to these patients? Well, that actually, so that is a decision for the health system to make. And, um, and obviously that has a lot of uh, ramifications and, impl and implications for, um, for how they're treating those patients and so forth. If there's no Wi-Fi in that area and there, there, you know, you have to actually make sure what type of cell signal is present in that location. There are a lot of operational factors. There are a lot of financial factors to consider. Um, but the good thing that's, that, again, that, that uh, Medicare did was it made telephonic visits payable. So to be able to connect with another healthcare provider and to be able to do a telephonic visit and, able, and you know, be able to get uh, reimbursed for that, it actually allows, um, it actually creates access even through telephonic visit. So at this point, we would have to weigh the benefits of giving them a smart device versus the, uh, the, what care models can be accomplished telephonically. Thanks, Greg. I'm gonna um, go to a question that was typed in pretty early on. It's about the place of service codes and CMS um, and whether or not you should use code two versus 11. I don't know if you have any insight on that. Yeah, so the place of service. So this is a, so, uh, um, this is a tough one. So what I'll tell you is this, is that my knowledge and again, my knowledge can, can be suspect um, based on some of the day-to-day -day changes. Um, 
basically um, is that if you are doing a visit where you are a distant site separate from where the patient is, which is the originating site, and you're doing an audio video visit, you should be billing place of service as zero two. I will give you an example in which, um, in which uh, we thought that place of service zero two should have been used, but we actually think that that's probably not the right thing. And that's where we're actually in, an, in a control room at one of our hospitals. And the doctor is in that hospital in a control room doing audio video telemedicine on an, e, on an ED patient in that hospital. That actually, we believe, and we're still looking into it, does not qualify for place of service zero two. It would actually be place of service uh, for what the hospital is. So my understanding is that you should use, and again, you would check with legal and compliance folks and go back to the CMS documents um, for your own personal advice. And again, this is, I just want to be sure that I'm telling you, my belief is that you would use place of service zero two, but please look at cms.gov for the newest and latest information. Thank you, Greg. We have a couple more questions that we weren't able to get to today, but because we're almost at the top of the hour, um, I again just want to thank you so much for your time um, and let everybody know that if you submitted a question, we will have um, those questions answered and included on the webinar links. Um, so please uh, check us out if you haven't been to needtech.org. Um, follow us on social media if you're about the social media and check out some of our skills videos that we have on YouTube. Um, and email us, info at newtech.org. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, again, this, this webinar has been recorded and uh, the slides will be available. So thank you, everybody. Um, be well, be safe, and uh, thanks for joining us today.